Good morning. Good to see everybody here this morning. Thank you for coming out to worship with us here at the Lenore City Church of Christ. And uh, you are coming in, if you've not been here the last couple weeks, on our part three of a series we've been doing on forgiveness, forbearance, and repentance. And we are on part three, and I have decided to do one more part after this. Um, I told you, just you know, it happens to go that way. But today we're going to start putting some stuff together, okay? We're going to start taking the idea we've looked at forgiveness, what it is and what it isn't. We've looked at repentance, what it is and what it isn't. Well, what happens when those two concepts meet, right? Because a lot of times when we're talking about forgiveness, um, we're going to start saying some things, you know, that may or may not be biblical. But one of the things that we've been looking at is forgiveness, at least in a sense, is the releasing of a debt, okay? You're releasing, somebody owes you something when they hurt you or when they harm you or offend you, and forgiveness is releasing that debt over them, okay? We need to always have the heart and the willingness to forgive. That's the kind of people we want to be, people who are ready and willing to forgive, because sometimes we start talking about the idea, well, I'm going to forgive them even though they have not repented. And I'm not going to go through all that again, but we've looked at God doesn't even do that. God does not forgive when somebody does not repent. He's willing to forgive. He's ready to forgive. He's waiting to forgive. And yet, repentance is, a, is something, and forgiveness is a response to that. Forgiveness can be denied. We looked at Scripture how forgiveness can be denied on the basis of no fruits in keeping with repentance. And so we also looked at forgiveness and loving your neighbor is not necessarily the same thing, all right? Because a lot of people, when they talk about forgiveness, they're talking about releasing anger, right? Um, I still need to love my brother. Jesus says to love your enemy. But I, I claim, and I think the, biblical, the Bible claims, that if someone is still your enemy, that therefore forgiveness has not happened because repentance and forgiveness is about reconciliation, not just releasing something of them. No, you're not to hate them. No, you're not to treat them unkindly. That's not the biblical concept of forgiveness. That's forbearance. All right? The idea that just because someone's harmed you, now you have the right to harm them and treat them unkindly and harbor anger in your heart. No, we are to get rid of all wrath and all anger. But that does not mean we can forgive on a whim. Repentance is more than just saying, I am sorry. Okay? There is the word means to turn or to return or to restore something. And so repentance has action behind it. It is not just mere words. And we kind of looked at, you ever force your kids to say, I'm sorry? Right? Do they really mean it when they're forced to say it? And does it really have its fullest effect? It doesn't. Okay? And one of the reasons why I think a lot of reconciliation doesn't happen is because we forgive before there is repentance. And therefore, we've already, we're done our job. We're done. I've forgiven them, and yet I don't have to deal with them anymore. It's not, that's not a biblical concept, and we're going to look at some of that today. And finally, a heart of repentance is followed by actions and emotions, okay? So let's turn to the scripture that we started in all the way back a couple weeks ago in Matthew chapter 18, and let's reread this passage. Matthew 18, 21 and 22, and this is kind of the foundation for this lesson, okay? Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? As many as seven times. Jesus said to him, I do not just say seven times, but 77 times, or 70 times seven. Your version may say something slightly different, but the concept is, and here's what the understanding is, that if a brother comes to me in the same day, 77 times, I am to forgive them. And so a lot of people conclude from this that no matter what a person does and how they treat me, if they come asking for forgiveness, I must forgive them 77 times. Absolutely 100% correct. Now, Luke adds in a little statement that I think is helpful in Luke chapter 7 and verse 3. Turn over to Luke 7, 
It's the same exact account. It's the same idea. The, um, the, the apostles come and ask Jesus, how many times are we to forgive? And look what he says. Well, let's start in verse 1. And he said to his disciples, Temptations to sin are sure to come, but woe to the one by whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck, and if he were cast into the sea, that he should cause one of these little ones to sin. Pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, what? Forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. Okay, and so we're looking at the idea, and you know, Luke kind of adds a little bit for us. There is a if he repents. And once again, we've looked at this idea of repentance is more than just, I am sorry. There is a fruit and an action behind it. Now, turn back to Matthew 18. In this context, Jesus is dealing with if your brother sins against you, correct? Look at verse 15. Look at what leads up to them asking Jesus, how many times am I to forgive my brother? Because the context of that statement matters. So look at verse 15, and we've already read this, but this all needs to kind of come together. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, if forgiveness is this, my brother sinned against me, but I'm going to forgive him and not deal with him, but I've already forgiven him in my heart. What is the first step when somebody sins against you? What is the first step? You are to go tell your brother or your sister your fault. I think right there is the one step that is always skipped, it is always passed over, and why this process never gets any further down the road. Because I'll tell you, what is the normal inclination when someone sins against you? Well, I'm going to wait for them to repent. The balls, they're the one who harmed me. The ball's in their court to come and tell me sorry and to repent for me. Now, I would say that would probably be the best process, wouldn't it? Somebody hurts you, they recognize it, and they come to you? That would be nice, wouldn't it? But if somebody's sinning against you, do you think they're in the state of mind to also recognize what they're doing? Because sometimes, now, there are sins that are intentional, aren't there? There are intentional offense, where somebody is like, they're gunning for you, they're coming at you with a sniper, and they're ready to take you out. And then there is the passive offense, isn't there? They may not have known that they even hurt you or harmed you. And so our job as Christians, when someone sins against us, is to go to that brother and to tell them what's going on. You hurt me. That really hurt me. And I'm, I'm hopeful, and I think nine times out of ten when I've actually done this, the person's almost shocked that I was as hurt as I was. They didn't even recognize or realize how much their statement hurt me. I've had the one out of ten where they, they realized it hurt, and they wanted it to hurt, and they wanted it to sting, right? And you still got to deal with that. But you are to go to your brother. I think that kind of gets rid of this idea of forgive them, forgive them, but have nothing to do with them. That's, that's not what we're talking about here. You are extending forgiveness, you are wanting to forgive. You are going to them and giving them the opportunity to say what? To repent. And now keep reading. Watch what he says. He says, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. Okay? The, the gossip train doesn't go first. Right? You don't start calling every person in the world. And then finally, right, that person hears that you've been talking about him or her all around. And finally, we come to reconcile when it's already been spread out throughout the entire world. Okay? Go to your brother alone. You'd be surprised how many things would be solved and worked out if we would just do this process. It's hard, isn't it? Isn't it hard? Because we're always expecting what? If they hurt me, when I go to them, there's a potential that they're going to hurt me again. They're going to hurt me even more. They're going to, 
And by the way, that potential is there because it's a reality. They could hurt you more. But you still have the obligation to let them know you hurt me. Now, what's the goal? This is what we've been talking about. If he listens to you, I love this. If he listens to you, you have what? Gained your brother. So do you see that? Do you see the process here? Someone sins. I'm hurt. I go to them and I'm looking to do what? To gain, which is to restore. That's the idea of repentance. To restore that relationship. To restore what has been broken. To release them of their debt. I have gained my brother. Now, if you keep reading, we're not going to read it all. If he does not listen, what's the next step? Two or three witnesses, not two or three buddies, right? Not two or three people who are ready to pounce on you, on the other person as well. Two or three who you've already told them your side of the story and colored your side of the story and made your start of the story sound really good so then you can go to this brother. You go to him and you deal with it. And if he still does not listen, you are to bring it before the church. And we kind of talked about that a little bit. I don't believe it's a... All right, Sunday morning, worship time. I'm ready to call out so-and-so who's sinned. And as a church, we are ready. That's not, our assemblies are very different than what we would have looked at in the first century. It was a, hey, church, community, we got a brother who's in sin. Let's all try to work on him. If we can whittle him down. All right, let's all kind of try our own different angles. We all got relationships with him. We can win our brother. We can still win him. All right? It's not a calling out. That's not that, not yet. And if he doesn't listen to the church, then he becomes what? He becomes like a Gentile to you, right? That's when disfellowship begins. And so, but the whole process is to gain your brother. And that's a lot of responsibility for the one who's, a, who's been offended, isn't it? I mean, what in the world, Jesus? Why do I have, I'm the one who got hurt. And yet I'm the one who has to go through all of this effort to restore it? Yeah. Why? Think about Jesus. Think about Jesus. Did Jesus have every right to go, you know what, I'm done with the world? Didn't he? And yet Jesus came and died for us while we were what? While we were still sinners. So if you want to be like Jesus then this is the big boy and big girl pants we got to put on to claim that if we're claiming to be like Jesus, this is, how we, this is the people we need to be. Okay, so there's a willingness. Now, so when, the, when Peter asked this question, when he says, how many times do I forgive him? The forgiveness happens if the brother does what? If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. Peter's asking, how many times do I go through this process with a brother in one day? He says, you, your obligation is to be willing to forgive at any moment they are willing to repent. But if there's no repentance, there's also no what? There's no gaining a brother if there's no repentance. And later, if you keep reading the parable that Jesus tells... This is the parable of the unforgiving servant. Remember, we've got uh, the servant who owes his master a lifetime worth of, of money. Something he can never, ever, ever, ever pay back. And he goes to his master and he says, Master, I, I can't pay you back. Will you release me from this debt? And he says, all your debt is forgiven. All your debt is forgiven. Well, that same servant has servants underneath him and that servant who's underneath the servant who has just forgiven comes and says and it's a small debt in comparison to the big debt right it's just a little thing and says hey can you forgive me and that servant goes no i won't forgive you and then the master who forgave the first servant finds out about it and removes the what the releasing of debt he makes him, all right, now, not only have I not released, you are going to pay me in full, and you're going in prison until it's paid. There is a removal of the releasing 
of debt, and it becomes even worse. That's exactly why Jesus, when he says, teaching them to pray, forgive us our debts as we what? As we forgive our debtors. Okay, so this is the context of Matthew chapter 18. There is a person who's been offended. He's willing to forgive. He wants to forgive. A brother comes, and if he, if he repents, if he listens, we can do what? We can forgive. If he doesn't, he's got to be a, a Gentile to us. You can't forgive someone who you're not in a relationship with anymore. Now, we're going to talk about next week how that relationship can change and be a little bit different, but we're, we're not talking about that today. Now, what I really want to get to this morning is the next passage. So I have it up on the screen, but I, I'd like you to turn your Bibles there anyway because just get used to using your own Bible. But I want it on the screen so you can kind of see. What I've done is all of the red are the emotions that are caught up around the idea of repentance. Okay? And the underlying words are all about the results of these emotions. Okay? So let me read this. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 8. For even if I made you grieve with my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, for I see that the letter grieved you, though only for a little while. Okay, what is Paul talking about? Paul wrote them a first letter. Go read 1 Corinthians and you can understand why Paul was a little scared to write that letter. Because it's all about, what are you guys doing? You're suing each other, you're picking favorite preachers and dividing over preachers, you're dividing over meat, you're dividing over, you know, your gifts that the Spirit has given you to edify the body, you're divided every single place that you can be divided, even when taking the Lord's Supper and coming together to partake in communion, you're divided over that. Every area of the church, they were at each other's throat, they were dividing, and Paul says, but I had to write this letter to you. It made me grieved. I did not like to do it, and I gotta, you got to understand, this process is not fun. It's not fun for anybody, okay? It's not a fun thing to have to confront someone about their sin, but it must be done, right? It must be done. And so, he, as we continue, look at verse 9. As it is, I rejoice. Not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. I want you to make the distinguish here between sorrowful, grieving, and repenting. Grieving leads to repentance, but grieving is not repentance. You understand that? Grieving leads to repentance, but being sorry by itself is not repentance. How many times have you been caught in something? Or how many times have you caught somebody in something? And you wonder, and they, you know, they have the whole emotion package to go with it, right? They get caught, I'm so sorry, I didn't mean to. You know, and it just, and you're wondering, we're going to see how this plays out. Are they sorry they got caught? All right? Or are they truly sorry that they recognize what they were doing was wrong. And real. And I'm going to be honest, there's, there's a, a situation that happened in Meadville, and uh, a guy got caught doing something, and he was glad that he got caught so somebody finally knew. He was glad so somebody finally knew he was living this kind of secret life, and then we could start working on the healing process, and the church came around this person and tried to help him because finally someone knew. To me, that was true repentance. He wanted to almost get caught. He was glad, he was sorrowful that he was doing it, but glad that he got caught so he could be working on it and have people who finally knew what he was doing and we could come together and help this brother. That's what repentance looks like. Okay? So we'll talk about that in a minute. But let's keep reading. I just want to read it all. He says, You were grieved into repenting, for you felt a godly grief, so that you suffered no loss through us. Look at verse 10. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation. Do you see this process? Godly grief leads to repentance, which leads to what? Salvation. That means this person has done what with their life? They've turned, haven't they? They've turned from what they were doing to now turn towards God. That's the idea of repentance. They're turning without regret. I love that aspect, too. I mean, how many times do people get caught and they're just mad they're caught? 
right? And they regret that they got caught. Whereas worldly grief produces what? Death. And I want to ask you the question this morning. How do you distinguish between worldly grief and godly grief? And I think the answer is repentance. Godly grief produces repentance. Worldly grief produces just the emotion. But what are they going to be doing again tomorrow? I mean, how many times have you caught someone in something and they just try to get better at hiding it? Is that repentance? Now, we got to distinguish. Repentance isn't a change to perfection. So we got to be careful. That's why when Peter is asking Jesus, when Peter's asking Jesus, how many times in a day shall we do this? Jesus says 77. If they've coming and repenting, they're listening to what you're saying, our job is to do what? Our job is to forgive. Because just because someone has said, I'm going to travel the road of repentance, I'm going to start turning, is that an immediate 100% switch automatically? Or is, or is that a process? Right? Let's say they're caught up in drugs. Or let's say they're caught up in pornography. Or let's say they're caught up in, you know, whatever it may be. You don't just, you know, oh, yeah, I'm going to get out of this and just one step out. You need help. Right? It's a road. Will they continue to stumble? Absolutely. Now, here is where the rubber meets the road. How do you distinguish between a person who has godly sorrow and is trying and keeps stumbling, or the person who's fooling you continues to have worldly sorrow but keeps going back into it? Sometimes it's hard to distinguish, isn't it? You don't know. Now, a lot of times, it's not until maybe a year or so down the road you recognize, okay, I understand what we're doing here. There's, this is, this is going to just keep going and going and going and going. Okay? But that's a fruit thing down the road. That's a judging a tree by its fruit. Okay? But repentance produces, or godly grief produces repentance, which leads to salvation. Look at verse 11. For see, I love all of, look at all these words that he uses. For see what earnestness this godly grief has produced in you. Godly grief has produced something. It's made you feel something. It's made you do something. Watch. But also what eagerness to clear yourself. All right? So this is a group of Christians who when Paul wrote his letter, and they finally, imagine reading that letter out loud, because that's how they did it. Imagine me getting up. All right, Paul's... Paul's wrote us a letter, guys, opening it up. We go, ugh. And you keep reading. We're waiting for the good stuff, right? You just keep reading. Maybe eventually we'll get to, you know, at the very end in chapter 16, he goes, oh, by the way, thank this family and thank this family for their service among you. But most of the other letter goes, what are you guys doing? What are you guys doing? And maybe when they read that, they all kind of went, oh. We didn't really realize how our actions and how our behavior was reflecting that of Christ, or reflecting that of not Christ. How much division was actually hurting us, and how we could solve all this if we put others above ourselves. He says they wanted to clear, they wanted to clear their name, and how did Paul say they did it? Through repentance. Paul says you were this kind of church, now you're this kind of church. That's how you clear your name, right? You don't make excuses for the sins that you've, you've done. You don't try to blame someone else and pass the buck, right? These people owned it. They owned their sin. They took responsibility for their sin, and they said, you know what? I will change. And as a group, collectively, they changed. Were they perfect? No, because 2 Corinthians, he still has some stuff to tell them, right? But they're on that road. They're going through that process. They're better than they were yesterday. That's why repentance is ongoing and forgiveness is ongoing, because don't think for a moment that someone's only going to hurt you once in your life. Don't think for a moment that you won't hurt somebody more than once in your life. So you need to remember how it feels to hurt somebody what it feels like when, you, when they confront you, okay? When they confront you with your sin, 
you've got to remember that when someone hurts you, that they may also feel the same pain and sorrow that you felt. That's why we go to our brother. Okay? That's why Paul says, I wrote this letter to you. And I'm hoping you figure this stuff out before I come. Because I really don't want to deal with this face to face. It'd be really good if we could figure this out before I come. But if I come, I'm coming hard. We're going to solve this. We're going to work this out. And they worked as hard as they could. Watch what they did. All right, so what eagerness to clear yourself, what indignation. Who do you think they were mad at? You think they were mad at Paul or themselves? What fear? Where would fear come from? Well, look at the lives they were living and how they were reflecting God. Do you think God's going to be happy with that? You think that's going to look for good for them on the day of judgment when they've divided the church? All the gifts that God has given, they're suing their own brothers and sisters in Christ? You think that's going to look good? I'd be scared, right? I wouldn't want God meeting me that way. What longing? What longing for what? To be better? To be more than they are? To be reunited with Paul and their other brothers? What zeal they had? And what punishment? Is it, hard, is it a hard process? Isn't it a hard process to change? Aren't there things you have to kill about yourself and put to death about yourself? And that, that, that's hard. It is hard. But it's helpful. It's very helpful if I harmed you and you come to me and say, man, you, you hurt me, but I want to work this out. That's, that gives me hope that I can do what? I can be better, and when I'm better, I can restore. But let me tell you, if you come to me and say, you hurt me, and I can never, ever, ever trust you again, I can never look at you in the face again, I don't want to see you again, but I forgive you. I forgive you. You've just left me, who's offended you, without hope of ever becoming better and, rest and proving to you that I can change, proving to you that I can be better, proving to you that what I did, I am sorry for, and I want to change because of how much God has forgiven me of and how much Jesus knows that when he forgives me, I can change. Isn't that the whole point of forgiveness with Jesus? That if he forgives us, we can be transformed into his, him, into his image? Well, we need to reflect Jesus in the way that we forgive, don't we? Be willing to restore those relationships. Okay? And once again, next week, we're going to look at, we're going to come up with a couple different scenarios and also in Scripture of some scenarios of forgiveness and repentance and how it worked out. And we're going to look at some nuances. But this is the ideal. We're talking about the ideal right now. Okay? Someone hurts you, they come to you, or you go to them, they, they repent, you forgive. But this is what the kind of repentance that we're looking for, isn't it? This is that zeal, passion, longing. Now, let's finish this sentence out, then we're going to move on to the next point. He says, at every point, you have proved yourselves innocent in the matter. At every point, they have tried and they have worked on everything that Paul has written to them about. And they've grown in and they've gotten better in. You know, it's easy. It's easy to repent of things that are small things, right? You know, we were in class, and you know, when you said uh, all New Yorkers, you know, act a certain way, you know, it kind of hurt me. And they go and say, I'm sorry I said that. I won't say anything. You know, I just didn't realize. It was a joke, right? You know, everything becomes a joke. Immediately when you get confronted, it was joking. What do you mean? I was joking, right? Um, we don't realize sometimes how words hurt. But let's say, I don't know. I don't want to get too specific. The sin's a whole lot worse. You've pointed me out specifically. And you've taken my name and you've defamed my name in front of other people. Let's just say that's it. Or I've defamed your name. Let's put it that way. Let's say I've taken your name and I went to other people and told them about what a dirty, rotten, pig-stealing great-great-grandfather you are. That's just my phrase, okay? And now I have other people, other people now think less of me because of what you've said about me. Or vice versa. Now when I'm confronted with that, that's a little bit harder of a thing to change, isn't it? Because now I've got to not only to show repentance, what, what should I do? If I've thrown your name around, 
What should I do if I'm going to repent? I'm sorry. I won't do it again. No, no, no. I'm sorry. Let me go correct that mistake. So I go to the people that I talked with and said, that was out of line. I should not have said what I said. I should not have done what I did. You know, whatever it may be. And name the sin. That's hard, isn't it? Because you've got to go to all those people now and swallow your pride and say, I've done something wrong. But that is what repentance is. You can't just say, let's bygones be bygones. We've got to stop that kind of, because guess what happens with bygones be bygones? Because there was no real consequence and there was no real repentance, there's a very strong likelihood that it's going to happen again. If they didn't have to own up to their sin and clear their name, there's a likelihood that, well, the consequences is I just had had one uncomfortable conversation with somebody and that was about it. Now, the desired result. We'll finish right here. This is where we're finishing. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. We've read this at every week, but I want this to kind of be the focus of our idea of forgiveness and repentance, okay? Remember, in the first letter, there was a guy who was sleeping with his father's wife. They were accepting of it. Look how tolerable we are. Look it. And Paul goes, even the Gentiles don't behave this way. Right? Get him out. Send him off to Satan, hopefully to restore the brother. But right now, you've got to clear the leaven. Get the leaven out of the body. Because it will leaven what? The whole lump. Well, apparently, in between this letter and the next letter, this guy has repented. Everybody knows about it. Now the church is struggling of bringing this guy back in. And I think this is where we struggle. It, I, there's some of us, I have no problem going and confronting someone. You know, you hurt me, I'll let you know. All right, some, some of us don't have any problem with that. It's the, now they've repented, now what do I do? This is, this is weird, I didn't think they would do that. Now I've got to receive them back in? That's the hard part, that's the hardest part. And here's what Paul says. Verse 5, now if anyone has caused pain, he has caused it to not just me, or not to me, but in some measure, not to put it to, too severely, to all of you. Right? So when someone sins, who does it hurt? Doesn't it hurt the whole body? All right, we got to get rid of this idea, leave me alone, it's just between me and God. Sin hurts everybody. Okay? It hurts everybody. For such a one, this punishment by the majority is enough. So the majority and the church did what? They got them out. So, see, he says it's enough, means he's changed. So you should rather turn to forgive and comfort him, or, me, or he may be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. Now, watch this. When forgiveness is not the response of true repentance, what happens to that godly sorrow when they have no way out? When they have no way to restore? They have no hope of making things better with you. Paul says that excessive sorrow will actually lead to more suffering. And if this person's never allowed back in the church, never allowed back in the community, never allowed back in the group, what's eventually probably going to happen with his spiritual life if he's not allowed back in? What do you think is going to happen to that man? He's probably going to go off on his own, isn't he? Very, very unlikely that somebody remains true to God by themselves and by themselves alone without some kind of group. Very unlikely. And so... This is where we struggle. So, verse 8, I beg you, I beg you. Wait a minute, he hurt us. Who's the bigger man? You're claiming to be Christ-like, aren't you? You're claiming to be a Christian, aren't you? I beg you to re reaffirm your love for him. Let him know he's loved. That's a part of forgiveness. Letting the person know they're loved. That's why I can't get along with this. I'm going to forgive, but ne do nothing, have nothing to do with you. That's not biblical. How can you show how much you love this person by saying, never talk to me again, but I forgive you? That's not forgiveness. Maybe they haven't repented, and so maybe that's where you're at, but quit saying that I forgive you. For this is why I wrote that I might test you and know whether you are obedient in everything. Paul says this is a test to see how Christ-like you are. 
How much like God you claim to be? Anyone, verse 10, anyone whom you forgive, I also forgive. Paul says, if you guys work this out, I'm going to trust that if you forgive him, that I can forgive him too. Why? Because this guy's obviously shown repentance. Why is this? I mean, there is probably months in between this letter, if not about a year in between this letter. What do you mean? Paul, you didn't forgive him immediately without his repentance? You're now saying that you found out about his repentance, now you're willing to forgive him? What, what, that kind of defeats our claim, doesn't it? That we can forgive without repentance? And we, because we're releasing, once again, you always want to release anger. You never want to hold anger against anybody. You never want to hold wrath against anybody. But it doesn't mean you can forgive everybody. Does God, is God angry at all of us all the time? Can God get rid of his anger towards people even though they're living in sin? Now, not the sin, right? So watch. I also forgive indeed. Indeed, what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, has been for your sake in the presence of Christ. So that, and I love this last verse. This is the most powerful verse in all of it. So that we would not be outwitted by Satan for we are not ignorant of his designs. I believe Satan would have us believe we can forgive without repentance. We can forgive and have nothing to do with somebody. We can forgive and just by God, just go our separate ways. I think that's a, a, a scheme of Satan. I think that's wisdom from the world, not wisdom from above. Because when you look at all the other passages about forgiveness... And how we are to treat one another, how do we tolerate one another, how we are to forbear with one another, how the strong are to bear with the weak, all of these lifting other people's, you know, above ourselves, all of this comes together. All because of what? What Christ has done for us. If we are to be examples of Jesus, this process needs to be known in his church. And how many relationships can you think of today that would be restored if true forgiveness and true repentance were actually, actually happened? How many relationships do you know were destroyed because true forgiveness or true repentance didn't take place? I'm going to tell you, and this is how I'll end, I've had some pretty big fights with people before. I just, you know, I, I say dumb things or people say dumb things, I say things I don't mean, or maybe I did mean them at the time. And when we go work it out, you know most of the time what happens after you work out something with somebody? You actually grow closer if it happens the best way. Think about a marriage. Think about a marriage that doesn't do this on a daily or weekly basis. Think about marriages that will not repent or not forgive. How long is that marriage going to last? Think about your marriage right now and think about all the fights you've had, all the things you've gone through, and how much stronger you are because of them or maybe weaker because true repentance and true forgiveness haven't happened. So this creates an opportunity for all of our relationships to be better and to be stronger because we are imperfect, aren't we? People are going to hurt us. And we're going to hurt them. It's reality. But so is Christ-like behavior. This morning, I want, to ask, I want to ask, if you're not a Christian, and let you know that Jesus came and died for your sins so that he may forgive you of all things. And I'm going to promise you, when Jesus and God forgives you, he's not saying, I'm going to forgive you, but I'm going to leave you alone. I'm going to forgive you, but I want nothing to do with you. When he forgives, he restores, and he reconciles, and he brings you back into the fold, and he sees you as one of his sons and daughters in Christ. That's what we need. That's what you need. And if that's what you need, there is a response. We can, we can talk. We can study together. What does that look like? How do I respond to God? How do I change my life? We'll talk about that. And if you are a Christian this morning, and maybe you've got a couple people in, in mind during this series about people who either maybe you need to forgive or maybe you need to repent too, I'd implore you to do it. I'd implore you to do it, and I want to I wanna pr promise you, I promise you that if both, especially if they're brothers and sisters in Christ, and they both are acting in a Christ-like manner, it will work out.
The problem comes in when we're Christians in name only, but not in heart and in spirit. So if there's anything that you need this morning, we ask that you come forward as we stand together and sing.